Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ecom Unfiltered. I am your host, Katie Dieter. I am the event marketing manager here at 8Fig. Uh, super excited today. We have an amazing guest. His name is Daniel. I should have asked how to say your last name. Now I'm realizing I didn't, so I don't want to mess it up. So I'll let you do your own kind of like intro. Uh, but we're so excited to have him here today. Uh, so thank you for being here. Awesome. I'm really excited to be here too. It's Daniel <laughs> Ocon. Or Ocon. If, uh, if you're if you live in Nigeria, which is where my family's from, you would say Ocon, but I don't know. I say Ocon. So yeah. Okay. That's I was gonna fine. say Ocon and then I was like, I don't want to butcher it. So <laughs> <laughs> I've, well, heard great. It said, I've heard it said so many different ways, especially when I was in high school and track. You would always hear like Oaken and, and so many, like, it's really interesting uh, how many yeah. different versions of a simple name could be butchered. But yeah, you're, yeah, you're totally- I feel that with my my married name. People don't know really how to say Dieter. They'll be like, Dieter, Dieter. And I'm like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> Cool. Well, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, we're going to dive into some questions and stuff, but I would love for you to just sort of tell us about yourself, maybe where you live and kind of a little history into how you got into e-commerce. Amazing. Yeah. So I currently reside in Toronto, Canada. Uh, you can hear uh, if anybody's from there, Toronto, I say Toronto. P- most people there say Toronto. I think there's a there's a movie on Netflix and, and they were all saying like Toronto wrong. And so I think there's like a big uproar, but I'm not from there. I'm from, <laughs> originally from Minnesota in the US, but I've been living in Toronto for the last few years. And I essentially met uh, somebody when I was traveling in Southeast Asia, and then we started long distance dating, and then ended up in um, moving up to where she lived. So that's kind of my uh, how I ended up there. In terms of a little bit about me, I uh, really started off in e commerce, kind of happenstance. I, I was I was really fascinated by consumer psychology. I started helping my sister with her business as well as a friend of mine who started a Kickstarter. Uh, He had a product he had launched and it did fairly well in the Kickstarter and he needed help. I think we did, we got like a click funnels up and running. So it was like back in the day, it was like several years ago and saw like just kind of like every day saw the sales start to like grow from uh, the paid ads from Facebook ads. That was kind of the glory days of, of Facebook 2017, 2016. Yeah. Um, and saw it grow quite a bit and, and kind of found a lot of excitement and it kind of hooked me like seeing that excitement. And now I'm, I'm pretty hooked in, in the world of, of e-commerce, uh, for all the ups and downs, uh, I've been pretty hooked, but another part of, of my life is, you know, I'm very much, you know, into things like yoga, meditation, things like that. One, one interesting note for me is I just completed a hundred days straight of meditation a few days ago, which is really oh, exciting. Wow. Uh, That's yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. I actually put it in my calendar. It was like a few months ago. I was like 100 days of meditation. It was like November 10th or whatever. And then I got there. I was like, oh my gosh, I did it. So pretty exciting stuff for me. Uh, I find it to be, I've never really had an easy time meditating, but uh, I decided to kind of commit to it. And it's become a little bit easier, kind of. Uh, I don't think it's ever super easy, but it's something that's really helped me in my personal life. That's impressive. I feel like I don't, I'm too like ADHD. I'd be like not able to shut my brain down and meditate, but I'm, that's impressive. I wish I could do that. <laughs> I mean, I feel, um, yeah. I feel like everyone says, and so many people say that, but I agree. I think it can be hard and I always have trouble even sometimes shutting my brain off, but yeah, yeah. eventually I get to a point where I'm like Zen once in a while. Well, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I would love to learn. So you talked about a little bit how you kind of got started in e-commerce. Um, and so I know Active is your company. I would love to hear, uh, you know, just the story behind finding your business and kind of getting started. Yeah. So, you know, it started with myself and a couple partners, uh, one who was really, really good on the Facebook ad side. Uh, and myself, I really focused on operations and and copywriting was an element. And so we started working with one brand. It was a friend who had the Kickstarter. And from there, we started really growing a lot of brands that came to us because we saw a lot of success with the first brand. So um, that was really in the day, the focus was really on turning the dials a little bit on the Facebook ad side. So focus was not on creative strategy. The focus was not as heavily on like the creative moving the the needle. And so we saw a lot of scale from just 
different interesting structures and different strategies and um, a lot of interesting things with like rules and things like that, like something called reveal bot. And so we would, we, we scaled quite a bit uh, with some different brands in that kind of direction. And then it was a few years ago, obviously with iOS 14, that changed a lot of things. We really had to shift a lot towards you know, stronger creative strategy, other ways that we could really grow brands. Um, but yeah, that's how we got started. And now we've really focused on really making sure we're focusing on two different things because we really kind of expanded as we grew these brands. It was just a couple, grow them to seven figures and eight figures. And we they leaned on us quite a bit for pretty much everything. We were pretty much their marketing department. So we would do their emails, we would do their site, their CRO, their ads, their Everything that could have to do with, uh, con- you know, getting a new customer, that's what we focused on. And so we hired, you know, different people to fill those roles, but, you know, we really expanded too much actually. And we actually realized that we were, we had too many things we were trying to do well. And so then we kind of pared down to focus now. And what we do is we focus on, you know, Facebook ads, TikTok ads, and creative. And really those are the things where we really feel like we do really well and we don't really think about other things. And and I think that's really a superpower that you can have if you are an agency, if you do it well, is focus on the things you do really well instead of trying to focus on a bunch of different things. Yeah, that's amazing. So that kind of leads me into my next question. You touched on it a little bit, but I mean, I was going to ask some of those early pain points. So was one of those pain points maybe just trying to do too much at one time or? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think whenever you're building a business, a lot of times you are trying to figure out, especially in the agency world, even sometimes, especially with e-commerce, you're trying to think about all the different ways you can grow. So it's like, oh, what if we started an email marketing part of our business? And then what if we did conversion rate optimization and landing pages and we're doing all these things? And on the e-commerce side, it's what if we started to focus on organic and TikTok and TikTok shops and Facebook ads and YouTube ads. So like you start thinking about all these ways to grow. And I think that's where a lot of businesses, especially agencies and e-commerce brands get in trouble because they don't actually focus on doing something really, really, really well. And that one thing that can do well for uh, at least the, the short to midterm to then build the foundation for other things they can do. And so I learned the lesson really maybe in a difficult way. Like <laughs> I learned the lesson that that's not easy to do and, and kind of crashed and burned. And we had to pe- pull back, you know, lower our overhead in terms of team. And then we started to try to make sure that we're bu- building the right people who, who have those expert knowledge and elements um, in terms of, you know, Facebook ads creative and focus on that. Yeah. So you touched on um, a little bit of, you know, obviously what Active does, but I would love to hear, I mean, you have a couple of core focuses. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on those and then maybe share um, some things you're doing with your customers currently uh, to sort of support them in this e-commerce space? Yeah. So you know, some of the basics are doing a, really a deep dive. We We have leaned into working a lot more with health and wellness brands. So a lot of our partnerships and a lot of our brands that we either own or we we partner with, which we have a portfolio of a couple of brands we own uh, alongside with our client brands, uh, are focused on health and wellness. And I think one of the things that we found to be extremely be- beneficial is the deep part of the research and doing the actual deep dive and un- understanding the psychology behind why people are buying and understanding. You know, these are these are age old things that people know, but a lot of people don't implement them in their strategy. For example, like pulling elements from uh, Eugene Schwartz's breakthrough advertising, understanding unique mechanisms of of the the consumer as well as the different levels of awareness that people are at. So really dialing in on what is the type of creative that we're trying to build that can actually kind of focus on the level of awareness. So for example... You know, one of our brands is a bath soap brand. So uh, it's it's a magnesium supplement that people will use. They pour it in their bath and it really helps them feel more relaxed and get better sleep. Well, if we think about it, a lot of times we're like, okay, what are the ways that we can market this? But you have to think about how many people don't know how you know, deficient they're in magnesium. So if you're unaware, you may be thinking, how can you really focus on the things like a lot of people don't know, like you can, your eye 
kind of sometimes twitches. And that actually is from magnesium deficiency. So oh you have to really dial. Yeah, I know, right? Sorry. You follow <laughs> like, your wait, so, that's me. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. So if you're seeing an ad like that, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, like I actually probably have a deficiency in magnesium, but that's you being unaware of the problem. And that is something that can be really, really effective as a hook or initially as a, the initial kind of messaging as you can get pulled in to be like, oh my gosh, that's me. And then, oh, sharing some of these other symptoms that are maybe like a little bit harder to explain, like fatigue or other things like that. So building out that kind of deep dive in terms of the strategy and research to really build out an understanding of the different levels of awareness to actually build strong, you know, advertising campaigns. Because in the end, you know, media buying isn't dead. I think it's very, very much alive, but the strategy behind it is extremely important to actually be able to pull off really strong results for brands. So that's what we found to be extremely effective and, you know, different concepts, whether it's, you know, static and, and, you know, video create all the different elements are important, but really diving deep into the actual deeper dive of like the research as well as the psychology to build out what's actually going to be effective is really important. Yeah, that's really cool. And I've actually kind of seen that firsthand. I've I've noticed on TikTok a lot lately, you'll see how you said, oh, like the eye twitching could be, you know, low magnesium. I've been seeing a lot of ads that are like, oh, do you bloat or do you do that? And like, it kind of draws my attention because I'm like, oh, that could be a product for me. So I kind of do see that as like the future of uh, advertising, especially on places that are super saturated, like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and that kind of thing. So that's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Oh, oh, just say, you need a unique, you need unique mechanisms, especially as things do get more competitive. And yeah. if you're not clearly understanding the unique mechanisms of whatever your brand is being able to focus on, then you're, you know, you're just going to be scrolled through and, and you're going to be have less profitable advertising efforts. And and we've seen that more and more as, as get, things get more competitive and CPAs get, get higher you have to be better. And, and, uh, if you're not, then it's kind of hard to be surviving in this space. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we have people like you and people <laughs> are in companies like active. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to switch gears like a little bit. Um, so we initially connected through Twitter, my manager, Emma, who's actually the producer on this right now. Hi, Emma. Um, <laughs> she's in the background, but, uh, she originally found you on Twitter and, reached out to you to get you on the podcast. But since then, we've been following along. Um, and, you know, we really see that you really advocate for diversity in the D2C space. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about maybe just some of your initiatives or businesses that you're working with that really support that message? Anything you want to share? Definitely. Yeah. So there's there's something where I feel like it's been something I've talked about a lot and I'll usually like see an event and I'll be like, there's no diversity and, and talk yeah. about it. Uh, I think there's, there's so many layers to it. And I think one, I want to say, I do see there is more effort being made, like obviously like getting podcasts that have more diversity and I've seen people reach out. And I will say what I found is it's the events. I think that usually will be, having the, the, the lack of diversity in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and people do say like, okay, there's less, you know, diversity in terms of leadership positions. And, and I think there is systemic issues, you know, where yeah. there's less opportunities and, you know, less, uh, op, you know, abilities for people who don't have the experience. And so it does create difficulties. One of the things that we're working on is we're going to be having an event in Q1 this next year of uh, it's going to be called fresh commerce. And that's going to be uh, fresh faces in the e-commerce space. Cause we do see a lot of the similar faces, mm-hmm. um, which many of them are super smart, super talented. And I want to, don't want to discount their abilities and their, their accomplishments. Uh, I do think that there are plenty of really talented people. So that's one of the things that we're actually working on that will be happening at the, you know, at some point uh, early 2024 to really give some voices and, and really give opportunities for some people, um, whether it's, you know, BIPOC uh, people or, or women or whatever it is, like give some voices that, you know, may, may be fresh in the space uh, that I'm excited yeah. to be able to um, highlight because a lot of times it's easy to complain about things, but it's, it's harder to actually implement uh, making change. And so even when I started, for example, on Twitter or X, 
that's one of the, the reasons why I tried to grow my following there because I wanted to be able to speak up and also give more voice to uh, minority voices uh, in the space that maybe are really great, but don't have the ability to share or have that platform to be able to share about what they're doing, what they're building. Yeah, totally. Um yeah, like, I mean, I know for us, and also 8Fig would love to get involved in that event in Q1. Um, I feel like we're definitely kind of going in more of a diversified route in sort of our event marketing plan. We've seen success with it. We just did um, an event called Black and Ecom this summer out in Atlanta, um, a really great, like, engaged group of sellers. And it was, like you said, fresh faces. It was people that, you know, we didn't see at these same sort of Amazon events that, you know, are a little bit less of a diversified crowd. Um, we've hosted female panels, uh, female founder panels. Um, and then obviously with this podcast, I love to try to keep it as diversified as possible, give a chance to, you know, women, men, BIPOC, like everybody. So uh, that's really cool that you're doing it. And, uh, we really appreciate you kind of speaking out on that and, uh, bringing it to light. I think events like that is super important. I love that. Yeah. We'd love (laughs) to be involved. Yeah, definitely. Let us know. We'll, uh, I'll shoot you an email after this. (laughs) Cool. So what is a common mistake that you see a lot of D2C founders making? Like what's the most common one you're seeing? Yeah. It ranges from size. So if there's a early stage founder, I think the biggest mistake I've seen them make is jump into working with an agency on the ad side and have them run their ads. I think that's a really, really difficult place to be because if, if it's like, if you are an accountant and you start the business. And like one of the most important things is actually like doing the taxes and you just like outsource it to somebody else to do it. I, it may be not exactly the same, but mm-hmm. it's really important to understand your c- customers and usually how you're going through the process, especially not only your customers, but also how you're marketing. Like it's usually one of the biggest growth levers for any e-commerce brand. And so if you don't really understand how to do it yourself, it's going to be really hard for you to hand it off to somebody else to manage it. Mm-hmm. Uh, as brands get bigger, as DC, DDC founders grow their brands, I think one of the biggest mistakes they make, I t- touched on this a little bit before, was to kind of look at other things and, and kind of get distracted by shiny objects. One of the most important things to grow brands is really going back down to the basics of creative, the offer, and elements on the site, whether it's landing pages or improving the, the user experience. Um, and then obviously customer experience is important in the product. And I think if the best brands do that really, really well and continue to go back to those things. And I found that when brand owners get kind of cute and they start to think about things that they, that kind of are off track of that, that's where they can find themselves wasting money using way too much, you know, inventory or money on or their actual cash on things that don't really move the needle. And really any brand that needs to grow is really needs to be focused on new customer acquisition um, to fuel that growth. And obviously retaining customers through retention is important, but the brands that haven't done well, haven't thought about how they're going to bring customers back through like making sure that they're doing a great job there. So that's probably the mix of like really mm-hmm. strong new customer acquisition and focusing on that and not doing that well. And then making sure that they improve their product or improve their product development process, which I feel is something that a lot of brands do make a mistake on uh, over time. Yeah, definitely. I I meet with a lot of founders on this podcast and I believe it was the last one I recorded. They kind of mentioned that same thing. They try to do too much at once um, and then they kind of ended up having some cash flow issues and things like that. So definitely like good to think it all through and kind of take one thing at a time or get really good at one thing before you move on to another. <laughs> Seems like the right move. <laughs> Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is like unit economics are really important. So understanding your overall unit economics and Mm -hmm. really being clear and defining your, what people, some people say your contribution margin or whatever that looks like to actually be profitable is sometimes overlooked and is not clearly defined. Even some brands are doing seven figures or most part, not eight figures, but a lot of times brands that are doing, you know, a little like around the seven figures mark or less, if they don't understand their clear metrics, 
then that's probably going to hold them back from growing and, and expanding to the next level of growth. And, and I've seen that over and over where if somebody doesn't understand that as a brand owner, they can't make the right decisions and they can't think the next three, six, 12, 18, 24 months out. And that can mm-hmm. kind of create problems in terms of their growth uh, trajectory. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, platforms like us at 8Fig, we can help you out there. So for those listening, yeah. check us out. <laughs> our little our little 8Fig plug of the day. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, so I noticed you sent out, you know, a newsletter and you seem really in the weeds on performance marketing and sharing metrics. Can you go a little deeper into that and tell us like what metrics you're keeping an eye out for um, and how you're kind of supporting your clients with those metrics? Yeah, the main metric that I look at and if there's a metric that keeps me up at night, it would be new customer CPA. So I think new customer, uh, new customer cost per acquisition is, is the term. Mm-hmm. And, and really how I look at that is if we are healthy in that number in terms of what our range is, then we feel good about growth and expansion in terms of that all leads into profitability and growth, in my opinion. So we want to be first order profitable. So for example, one of our brands that we that we um, have a, a partnership and ownership in, it's called Fluid, and, and we've been growing that brand. And one of the most important things that we've had to focus on is new customer acquisition, as well as across the board with all of our other brands. And so what I think about a lot in terms of just even when I think about tactics, I think about what are the the ways that we can build the best strategy around that new customer acquisition. So like whether it's a brand that can do really well in whitelisting or other, other tactics to really build trust for that customer. I think a lot of this stuff has to happen in terms of research and understanding how the, the customer is actually interacting with the brand. Some brands, they take months and months to actually make a decision. Um, some are really quick in the first day, first week. Uh, so there's some tools like, you know, no commerce you can use to look at the post purchase data. But those are the things that I think have been the biggest focus for me and specifically new customer acquisition costs is actually probably the most important uh, metric for me. That's awesome. Um, are you sharing, like, are you having, you know, weekly, monthly meetings with some of your clients to review these or how does, how does that work? Yeah, so we do uh, monthly uh, pulses that go over all that data. We have usually a, a platform uh, dashboard that we go over that, and it's you know daily updates, all that uh, daily, weekly, um, and monthly. And really, that's where we're drilling down, and, and that's that's where the conversation continues week over week, month over month, to be looking at that based off of the goals that we have put together as a you know with our clients, as well as. Uh, what we want to do based on spend. So some brands are a little bit more aggressive on their overall new customer acquisition costs that they want to hit because they f- feel like they can make it back on, you know, the LTV or the 30, 60 day, 90 day uh, lifetime value for the customers. Uh, for us, uh, we, if I'm going to do a strategy and we talk about uh, our plan, we do generally want to see initial uh, profitability on, on first time customers. So we generally are planning that out and we are talking about that on a on a monthly basis as well as is having those updates on a weekly basis as well as the the dashboard that c- clients can look at anytime they want love it super thorough i bet your clients love you <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So before we get into like fun questions, because I always like to end with fun, I do have one more kind of serious one, if you will. Uh, So what do you see for the future of e-commerce? Like what direction? And this is like a very broad question. So um, you can kind of narrow in as much as you want, but what do you see for the future? So I think there's a demo, like democratization, I'm maybe butchering that word, but uh, of, Demo- of democratization, democratization, there we go, <laughs> of affiliates. And I think mm-hmm. affiliate has been an interesting kind of like, dark and very under the hood type of thing where nobody knows. But a lot of brands have grown through affiliate. If you look at um, Athletic Greens and some of these, these brands mm-hmm. that, that have grown a lot, affiliate has been a big, big growth factor for these brands. And one of the things that we're seeing, for example, TikTok Shop is showing how powerful affiliate can be if it's incentivized correctly. 
if that is being done in a way that's really effective, um, you're seeing that affiliate can be a really, really strong factor into growth. You have to be able to measure it. You have to be able to pay it out. You have to be able to like actually see how those transactions are going. But I think TikTok is showing how that's going and it's probably going to eventually pour over into Instagram, uh, mm -hmm. maybe Facebook as well. And that's going to be, I think, one of the most impactful ways for brands to grow. We're already seeing it with some brands doing really, really well in TikTok shops. But I think it's just a, a signal to show how Instagram could implement that and help creators actually make more money that if they know that their content is actually going to drive purchases and they can measure it, then it's a really great way for a brand and for a creator to actually do really well together um, with a platform like TikTok, Instagram, possibly Facebook as well. Can you give us like, uh, is there a brand who's just doing it really well right now that if someone who's listening wants to go check out a good uh, like example of this? Yeah. Oh man. I was just, I put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's, um, I forget. It's like something K beauty. And, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the actual name, but, um, it's, they're doing really well. If you just maybe search something K beauty, they, they sell these, these brushes, I'm going to butcher this because I don't actually know exactly okay. it's like a makeup brush. If you look <laughs> up makeup brush K-Beauty or something, you'll, you'll find it. And they've been crushing it. And I think one of the most incredible things is usually it's going to be brands that have more visual type of appeal. So, mm -hmm. you know, people who can really engage with that. But yeah, I think they've done over like a million dollars in, in sales wow. over the last couple months since they launched TikTok shops and they're talking about doing eight figures next year uh, just from TikTok shops. So I think it's it's a very, very good opportunity for brands if they can work with creators and, and build out that type of partnership mm -hmm. with different affiliates through TikTok. I love it. Is it called BK Beauty? I just Googled BK really quick. Beauty. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It. BK Beauty. So for those listening, if you want to check out someone doing a good example of that, go check them out. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Okay. We're going to get into some fun questions, kind of lighten it up. The best part. Woo. Um, <laughs> all right. So if Active had a mascot, what would it be and why? I feel like it would be a badger because I feel like a honey badger because like the team is super scrappy. We're a small team and we're never uh -huh. going to be this massive agency. We work right. with a certain amount of brands, usually about a dozen. And we really find ourselves to be like, how do we get this done? How do we get su success and results? And we'll just like go for it. So, you know, if it was a honey badger, that was also a little bit nice too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of the honey badger don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's probably gonna age me. That's such like a millennial thing. <laughs> I, I get that. <laughs> okay, good. I'm like, are you a millennial? Yeah. <laughs> awesome, love it. Okay, another fun one. Um, I've actually never asked this before, so this will be interesting to see how this goes. So, if you could ask any person, dead or alive, to attend a dinner party with Active and your partners, who would you pick and why? Because we're in the marketing world, I would have mm -hmm. to go with David Ogilvy. I really find him to be okay. a very big, um, he's made an impact on me. He's made an impact on our team in terms of how we think about marketing and research. And so okay. it would be just really fun to just like be around him. I've read books about him and, and his like several of his books. And uh, so, yeah, it'd be really fun to kind of pick his brain, if you will. He's built, you know, one of the biggest marketing agencies in the world. And they obviously have went on to be super successful. So that would be something that I'd really be interested to sit down and have dinner with somebody like him. That's really cool. And for people who don't know who he is, he's technically the founder of advertising or the father of advertising. They call him the father of, of advertising. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought, but I was like, I just want to make sure I'm thinking of the right person. <laughs> so. Cool. That's a cool one. That makes sense. I mean, for the business that you're in. So awesome. Okay. Those are my only fun questions. I'm sorry. Not as many as I would like, but that's okay. <laughs> cool. So we'll wrap it up with a couple more questions. Um, so if for those listening, if there's one piece of advice that you could give them, um, you know, to take away today, what would that be? To... I know you probably have a lot of advice, but <laughs> yeah. So to simplify and make sure you're doing the main and important things really well. And whether that means you're focusing on, you know, the best product possible or the best creative possible and do that really well 
And I think it'll show dividends and it'll make the most, the biggest impact. I think when, again, when we try to do too many things, it gets very difficult to understand what's effective. So if you're able to do something really well and see the impact, it's going to pour over in all the rest of the parts of your business. Perfect. Great advice. Awesome. Well, before we wrap up, um, I would love for you to share, you know, where people can follow you on social or check out Active, all the good things. Definitely. So if you want to follow me on social, you can go on X now, which is, I still call it Twitter. I feel like I'm going to call it Twitter for like- Everyone calls it Twitter still. (laughs) Yeah. It's at the Daniel Ocon. That's my my Twitter. So you can see uh, me also time, sometimes shit posts, but also share insightful information. Love a, shit post. <laughs> a lot of fun stuff happens in Twitter. So there's a lot of drama. Um, <laughs> the other place you can go, we, again, we mostly focus on working with health and wellness brands that are doing between usually seven and eight figures. And that is, uh, you can go on our website, www.weareactive.com. There's no E at the end of that. And you can find out a little bit more. You can look at case studies. Uh, and see some of our work. So that's where I would go if you want to work directly with myself and my agency. Perfect. Daniel, thank you so, so much for joining us. This has been really fun. And uh, I learned a lot chatting with you. So I'm sure our audience did too. For those tuned in, this is another episode of Ecom Unfiltered, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.